Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weekly Science Hour. This is Dr. Pamela Gay. I am hosting it this week. Emily will be off for most of the month of July, so uh, stay tuned to see her in August. Uh, with me this week is Peter Platzer, who's been working on the ArduSat project, which is a um, project to build a microsatellite using Arduino technology. These are little tiny circuit boards that you can easily program off of your personal computer. They get used in schools. It's, it's the perfect starter equipment for, for learning how to program. And he's crowdsourcing a way for you to get your ideas into space. And, and Peter, thank you so much for joining us. My I'd pleasure. love to know how you, you got the gumption to say, we're going to launch a satellite. Well, uh, I went to uh, the Singularity University in 2009 and met Peter Diamandis, probably the, the father of commercial space. And he is probably one of the most inspirational people that you will ever get a chance to meet. And he was uh, uh, very, very uh, open about the, the new opportunities in space. And so I went to the International Space University, which he is a co-founder of, in uh, 2011. And there, uh, we have a very interdisciplinary approach to studying space. So we talk about business, we talk about technology, we talk about science. And there, the idea was born to build something that makes space accessible and affordable to everyone. That that's wonderful. And the International Space University program is is a great program. I was one of their instructors last year in Graz, Austria. And every summer they offer a, a program for uh, professionals who are getting started in the space industry. And they bring in people to talk about all different things. I was, I was there discussing uh, how to do citizen science and engage in social media to, to crowdsource people to follow your space program. Um, this year, International Space University, I believe it's already filled. It's going to be down in Florida. But next year is in Brazil. So if you're looking to get yep. engaged in becoming yep. part of Arrow. Yes, Rio de Janeiro. So if you're looking to get engaged in being part of the future of space flight, this is the program to take part in. Um, people from Virgin Galactic, NASA, European Space Agency, all the major players are all graduates of this program. So, so you, you got correct. involved, you, you learned as much as you could, and, and did you have experience building satellites prior to getting the idea for this Kickstarter? I did not have any experiences building satellites, but I am a high energy physicist. So I spent some time in experimental physici physics at CERN um, on the, on the uh, Delphi experiment as part of the Austin contingent. And I wrote my master's thesis in fusion physics, uh, spending some time at the Max Planck, in, uh, actually crawling through a Takama fusion reactor. So I have a little bit of experience with, uh, with high tech machinery. Um, and that kind of like helped to break down the, the barrier of frightened of uh, uh, towards a, a high technology device. And, and not only that, but working in high energy astrophysics, I, I actually did that as an undergrad and wove fibers for, for Atlas that's now at CERN. Yep. And um, the number of people involved in these collaborations makes the number of people involved in minor satellites look tiny. And, and so you, you must have the experience in working with big collaborations as well. Yes. And that's got to be useful. Now, to jump from physics to getting something launch ready, how did you build that team of people? And, and what was the process that you went through to go from, I want to launch something into space, to I have the right people together to build something into space, to we're going to fund this through crowdsourcing? Uh, I think that is where my Harvard Business School education and my, my, my 10 years in, in, on Wall Street and the Boston Consulting Group kicked in. Uh, we literally went from napkin to Kickstarter in and in that timeline phase, A and B of the satellite, we uh, have over 500 customers and over $85,000 raised through Kickstarters and we have been talking about in over 175 media outlets across the world from 
from Discover Magazine to TED and you know CosmoQuest as well um, has been very great in picking up the story. So it, it is the combination of that scientific background and the experience in the business world of like who are the right people that you, that you need to kind of make this happen. And ISU is a great ground for finding those individuals because it's a very, very intense program. You go through many a late night and you figure quickly out what are the people that can actually pull through at that last hour and who are the people that can't. And you also figure out who are the people we have the right uh, chemistry with. And so I was very lucky to, to work uh, a lot with Joel, Yerun, and Reka, my other three partners in that venture, um, doing that program and, uh, and get fired up with them of building, building out of such so that anyone can come up with their own idea and upload it to the satellite and get their time and space. Now, now, I know that it's very easy to blow things up when you're writing software. It's, this, this has got to be one of those things where it's in orbit. You can't fix it. So, so what are yeah. the types of checks and balances that you're thinking ahead to putting into the system so that people can try their ideas but not destroy the satellite? Right. So there, are, there, there is, a, is a layer of protection very similar as we do in computer security. Um, you know, as, as yourself, you know, I've been, I've been writing software for some 30 years by now. So I'm very familiar with that layered kind of security. Um, the first layer is that the Arduinos that um, uh, the, the users get access to have a replica on Earth. So before anything actually gets up into space, it gets up on a replica on Earth run here. And if everything checks out here on Earth, you know, that is like the first step. Um, and, and, you know, over the time I've become a pretty good beta tester of software. So you can rest assured that anyone sends us a code, I will prop the code around to make sure it actually does what it's intended. Um, so that is, that, is, that is the first layer. The second layer is that there is a, a master Arduino who is basically sitting on a, on a medium-sized reset button that if anything goes a little bit haywire, uh, we call them watchdogs, he can reset um, individual Arduinos or the whole bank of Arduinos. And then on, on top of that, the, the flight computer of the satellite is like you know, the, the, the big Hal Coogan who, who sits on top of everything else and is significantly more powerful from its processing capacity. And he has a very, very large reset button. And, and so his watchdog timers, if anything is not kosher, he just presses that reset button and, and everything gets reset and, and goes into the starting from scratch routine. So, so it sounds like there's a whole lot of different things that, that are going into this mission. And I know it, it's actually grown as your funding has grown. Um, what did you start out hoping to build and what does it look like you're now going to build since you've, you've surpassed your original Kickstarter goals and are now onto your stretch goals? Um, so the original goal was to build you know, as simple as possible um, a one new satellite and, and get enough uh, people involved that we can build it um, and hope for uh, a, an education NASA which has the downside that it can take, you know, two or three years um, to get uh, on, on the launch flight. It can happen within one and a half years as well, but definitely there is a, a very big time flexibility. Um, and we reached that first goal within six days. And, and then definitely, you know, we started to hope and dream significantly bigger and uh, started to think about uh, two U satellites. So the current one U, which is 10 by 10 centimeters, and the two U is literally exactly twice the size. And so with twice the size, you get twice the power, and you know, more power is always good in space. Um, you get more room, you get more weight, so you get um, significantly more opportunities. The, the downside is that um, we were able to secure a commercial launch for a 1U satellite that happened in between the start of the Kickstarter campaign. Um, and, and so we, we knew that we can launch a 1U satellite relatively quickly, even if we don't get an educational launch from NASA. And then our backers pretty much overwhelmed us and surprised us because we thought, well, you know, let's, let's shoot, shoot for 75 and see if that happens. And um, no one really thought that we would get that much support from the global artist community. And then literally, like within another two weeks, we shot through the $75,000 as well. 
Um, and so, so now there is a lot of new options on the table. Um, we could build a 2U satellite and do a, a free launch with NASA, which might take a little bit more time. We could build two single use satellites and do one with a free launch that takes a little more time and one with the commercial laws that we could do immediately. Or we could do something in between. We could try to get people to support us. Um, we find like another backer from, from the outside to help us with a second launch that we now need as well. So now there is a lot of opportunities out there. Um, and, and to be you know entirely open here, here the community is we just simply did not expect to get as much support well, so not a hundred percent on top of what we can do next. Well, you're you're doing the type of thing that I mean, who hasn't dreamed at some point, even if it was only when they were five years old, of being part of launching a spacecraft? You're enabling people to be part of that, and and as someone yeah. who who works with CosmoQuest to enable people to work with data from satellites, I know that people just want to be part of space exploration and I, kudos for, for helping to enable that. Now, as a scientist, I have to ask, what sensors does your satellite have? What, what sorts of information are people going to be able to send back to Earth? So I, I'm going I'm to start here you know, with, the, with, the, with the level one simple uh, sensors, which are uh, uh, vibration sensors and uh, uh, gyros and accelerometer which you can use to figure out the positioning of the satellite. Um, we're going to try to make some kind of launch data available to people. We're going to, uh, uh, as people are going to have the ability to turn the satellite in different directions, we're going to make that um, data available to them as well. Uh, then the next level is you get uh, light sensors that can uh, give you a, a sense of where the sun is coming from and what the angle towards the sun the satellite has. And you have magnetometers that give you a sense of the Earth's magnetic field, so you can measure the protective mantle of the Earth and get a sense of that. Um, and we have temperature sensors that can allow you to see the what's called temperature snap. When a satellite moves from in the sunlight and you know over 100 degrees, 200 degrees Celsius into the shade of the Earth, which is uh, you know minus 50 degrees Celsius, so that's like I don't know, my, you know minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So that and that happens literally within seconds. So that's also a fascinating thing. And then we move on to I would say you know sensors 3.0, which uh, some of our partners have helped us with, and those are Geiger counters to measure cosmic radiation and their spectrometer uh, that will allow you to see the spectral distribution of light that comes from the sun or is radiated away to or from the moon and, and allows to literally see the atmosphere and get quite scientific with your citizen science experiment. That, that's kind of awesome. Now, I know it, as much as you can learn more from spectrometry and all of these sensors than you can from a basic image. Most people just want that basic image. Do you have any just straight out cameras on board? Yes, we certainly do. Um, it is one of the first things that we decided to put on is right now when you want to put a picture of uh, Earth from space onto your website, um, you have to ask NASA for permission. And we wanted to give people the chance to do the opposite, to take that awesome picture of Earth and if NASA wants to use it, they would have to ask you for permission because it is your picture from space. So yes, um, we have, I have two cameras on board. Um, and we have the, you know, a small package where for $150 you will be able to steer the camera to take that kind of angle that you want uh, the picture to take um, and get 15 pictures of, uh, for yourself and that's going to be your Now where this is a steerable spacecraft, is it going to be strictly Earth imaging or do you have the ability to do wide field space imaging as well? Yes, you will have the ability to turn this to limited by the resolution of the camera, um, but don't forget this is Artisat version one. And if there's anything we have learned so far is that the, that the demand and the desire from people across the world to get involved is even greater than we would have hoped for. And so if if all goes as we hope and everything looks like it will, we will be keep on building those artists even better uh, better every single year and have more people getting access to space. The, this is all sounding great. Now, 
I know with everyday satellites, there's a lot of small issues that you have to deal with that become not so small when you're trying to figure them out. How are you dealing with things like getting data back from the mission? Do you, do you have a dedicated radio dish that you're using? Does it download once a day? Does it speak via other satellites that are in orbit and relay down? How are you dealing with the communications issues? Right. So you are diving right into the heart of the complicated space part um, and complicated space technology that our goal is to prompt the user as much as possible so that they have an easy experience. For those that want to dive into that, into that hardcore part, um, the first decision that we made is to use a very experienced engineering and integration that has built many a CubeSat before and has space proven um, uh, hardware. So we bus is like the general satellite uh, through our partner GOMP space in Europe and they, they uh, provide both the communication, the flight computer, the batteries, the panels, everything that makes the satellite uh, perform well. With the ground station side, um, we're using a particular type of frequency that is, uh, is uh, for, it's available, it's called the amateur radio frequency. It is not 100% certain yet. Um, but the most will be the frequency we will be using and uh, GOM space is a, is a ground station that we will be using. We will be using our own ground station here in San Jose. Um, we are uh, looking with a, a company university in the Midwest for a ground station and we have in Texas a ground station as well that we will be using. Um, there is a potential for an Australian ground station to come on board as well. So we'll have at least four, possibly six ground stations across the world they will provide plenty of coverage for Ardeset to get people their data down. That, that's awesome. Now, what, what sort of an orbit are you looking for, or does that depend on your launch vehicle? You are 100% correct, Pamela. I mean, it depends on the launch vehicle. Um, the, the only thing which is a requirement from our side is that the orbit is not too high because we don't want our satellite to become space debris. Um, we are very, very strict on that. So any orbit which is above 500, at most 550 kilometers, we will just simply not consider because that is reaching orbit lifetimes of 10, 15 years. And, and that is, for me, too close for comfort to the 25 years, kind of like chin implement agreement that we have world years. So we are shooting for an orbit time, literally a few months to maybe a couple of ways with a very short period of time. We want to make everyone comfortable that um, you can bring a spacecraft up there and give everyday people access to it and they will have absolutely magnificent things to do and it doesn't create space to create any problems for anyone else. That, that's a good attitude to take with building your mission. And, and to give some perspective, the, that's a similar altitude to where you're finding the International Space Station. It's, it's uh, I believe, about 300 miles up. And yeah. so I know the International Space Station has to worry about getting clobbered with debris periodically, and, and it has the ability to move. Now, your small little tiny spacecraft isn't going to have that sort of, it can, it can pivot using gyroscopes, but it's not going to be able to raise and lower its orbit to run away from oncoming debris. Um, how much of a concern is that for, for a mission this tiny? I know ISS is huge, so it's easier to hit it. Right. Um, we calculated that. Um, if I were to play the lottery for a billion years, I would have about the same chance of winning it big as my satellite has a chance of being hit. That, okay. That, fair enough. Sounds like you're a pretty safe little, little spacecraft. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now as, as you're gearing up for this, you're using social media and traditional media to get your Kickstarter publicized, you're getting lots of, of publicity. How are you going to keep this momentum moving forward? How can people get involved in those months that are going to drag out between now and when you actually have a spacecraft ready to get delivered to a launch facility? So the first thing that we're going to do is we have uh, provided that uh, a URL www.nanosatisfy.com in all of our media communication. 
And that URL, which currently is at the Kickstarter page, will then flip over to our own page, where we'll, where we'll have a blog. Our backers will start to be able to try out their codes um, and interact with each other and talk about that. our backers who are thinking about uh, challenges that they want to put in front of a number of schools or uh, uh, the you know their local uh, Boy Scout or Girl Scout or other kind of like science related group. So there will be a constant level of engagement with the satellite from that angle and we will do anything we can to support those people and keep the momentum up and going. And then again, um, as you said, our Kickstarter campaign is going pretty well. So who knows? Maybe we are building a cycle. I think that would be uh, probably creating a second. Second, in a few months, we can say, well, you know, we figured it out, and you know, here's the second one. This is what's going to do, and this is the double-sized one, and here's how they're going to interact. So. Uh, I think there's going to be plenty of ways for people to interact. Um, we will be, you know, we have already interest from literally all across the world, volunteers who want to help us, and, and we will, you know, tap into that global community. Two chance to stay very vibrant and very active over the coming, I would say, you know, six to twelve, um, actually be available for everyone to play with. That, that's great. Now, looking at your Kickstarter, your original goal was $35,000. You, you're currently, at the moment that we're recording this, at over $85,000. And that sounds like a lot of money, but then you start thinking how much human beings make in terms of salary. And this isn't looking like enough money. Are you guys all doing this as volunteers and still maintaining a, ba a day job? And how do you go to work each day and say, oh, yeah, my hobby is I'm building something that will launch into space? The, the true answer is uh, the next 12 months about to bringing this satellite to life and making it available for everyone. So, and yes, I mean, we are, we, uh, yeah, actually, especially myself, are putting in our personal money because if you take all the costs that it takes to build a satellite, to launch a satellite, to know the other arrangements around it, um, you don't go very far on, on even $85,000. Um, and definitely with, with four people involved, they, they, they could not eat uh, a whole lot in those four years or pay any rent. So um, none of that money gets touched by any one of us. That only goes to the satellite, and we are contributing 100% of our time um, and, and of our passion to this. The, uh, the hope that we have, um, and we have been getting a lot of traction with that, is that we are demonstrating in the market that there is a desire and a need, and that we can translate that into talking with investors about a potential business opportunity, which can do this on a much, much is that the same way now everyone has an iPhone, um, in, in a few years' time, everyone has, uh, has their own satellite or time on a satellite, and who knows what people can come up with. Uh, it took the, the, the Apple uh, App Store, within four years, it created 600,000 uh, applications and 25 billion downloads and 500,000 jobs in the U.S. alone. And it was just an access to an, one microprocessor and four sensors, uh, a microphone, a camera, and a giant accelerometer. And what we are doing is we, we want to put an, an open processor in space and give uh, open access to it and give you 25 sensors. So our hope is that we can demonstrate the market need and uh, that can drive STEM education and engage people in space and that investors will see that and will support us in starting a company around it. That, that sounds knows? like a that, that sounds like a great vision. And just to pause for a moment for a station identification, uh, you are tuned in to the Weekly Science Hour. This is hosted by CosmoQuest. I'm Dr. Pamela Gay, and I co-host this with Emily Lakdawalla. She's away for the month of July, so you're going to be seeing me this month. Uh, this week, we're talking with Peter Platzer of the Ardu Satellite. And, um, 
he's, he's working to get your ideas launched into outer space. Now, if you'd like to ask any questions, you can do this either on the YouTube channel via Google+, or uh, using Twitter with the hashtag pound CQX. Um, so we're watching all of those, and I'm seeing that we have folks tuned in from Mexico, London, one of your backers from the Lower East Side Great. Girls in Orbit has, has commented in. And, um, I <laughs> This was actually Dave Pentecost. Um, oh, sorry, it was Dave. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. <laughs> and um, Scott Lewis is out there. He posted the useful link to the Arduino uh, chipboard website is arduino.cc, and Arduino is A-R-D-U-I-N-O. It's a lot of fun to say and always hard to spell. Now, yeah. if, if someone wanted to get started, preparing to get ready to be part of your mission. What is the best way to get involved in learning how to use the Arduino technology? Well, there is, there is a, I would say, you know, uh, a million different ways of get started with this. I can, I can tell you how I get started. Um, I am a subscriber to the Make magazine since version one, since the first one, single one of the, of the Make magazines in my, in my bookshelf. Um, and they have done a pretty good job in packaging the, the Arduinos with like a, uh, simple sensors, and you can buy there. I think I think they have, they have like a package for thirty-five or for fifty dollars or something like that, and that can get you started in building experiments. You know, right off the bat, and it's uh, it's very well laid out. Um, if you if you want to save a little bit of money, you can uh, you can uh, find Arduinos and, and cheap sensors in in many of your local stores, including Radio Shack and. And Sparkfun is a is a is a great uh, online company that uh, is providing many of the sensors. They are featuring us on their web page. They are a supporter of the Artisan project as well. So I can, I can highly recommend them. Those are the sensors that we are using and we are offering for our satellite. So uh, between one of those sites uh, and, or one of those stores, I, I would say get yourself an Arduino and, and go online. The, the Arduino.cc web page is a phenomenal web page. Um, I, met, uh, I met both Massimo Bansi and, uh, and Daniel, I forgot his last name now, uh, from... Uh, uh, who founded um, Arden, uh, Massimo talked about us at Tech Global Conference uh, in the end, and they have done a phenomenal job in everyone uh, into the, this world of building the world around you in objects that physically move, which, uh, I mean, even though I'm a software guy, I, I find it massively exciting to build software and put it on a hardware thing that then moves through the room and does something fun. What, what, what I love is just how technological science has become. I, I'm an astronomer and I spend 90% of my time that isn't spent on email, which is too much of my time, 90% of my non-email time programming computers to accomplish the things I want to figure out. You're a person with a background in high energy, uh, high energy physics. You're now working on the software side. Now, I admit, a lot of my programming is for work, but occasionally there's the random, I just want to fix something that's annoying me with software. What, what was that first yeah. thing that triggered you to uh, try and, and do something with an Arduino? What was your first maker experience? What was my first maker experience? You know what? My first maker experience was actually not with Arduino. Um, it was with the HP41. Uh, which was like the calculator that got me through through university and physics. Um, and back then in college, my budget was a little bit more constrained than when I was uh, uh, full-time working. And there is this massive global community of HP41 enthusiasts out there. And I looked around what kind of software had not been written. And so the, we have uh, matrix uh, software, we have uh, complex number software, but the one I don't think no one had a 1980 uh, uh, pocket calculator uh, was multi-precision uh, library. So uh, through a three very intense uh, months, uh, I spent literally the evenings and, and, and late night hours in building an assembly coded uh, multi-precision library for this 1980 calculator that allows it to do a thousand digit precision arithmetic, something that even Excel or your modern PC can't do. That, that's 
Fabulous. Now, now Arduinos are a far cry from that, and I know you can do lots and lots of fun things with them. I, I work with someone who uh, programmed one to light up whenever he had email from a specific person that he needed to pay attention. It's just silly, but it worked. So, so what are some of the things that you've done with Arduinos? Um, uh, some of the more the, the more fun things uh, uh, I did was on a on, on a quadcopter. We needed to build a um, a, a variable pitch uh, uh, control. We wanted to put a quadcopter on a zero G flight from NASA. So I was on the on the Arduino side, and basically what it did there is it's just like um, changing the pitch of the um, uh, pitch angle of the uh, propellers on the quadcopter, and that would change if it what would. would going up or down. Like the simple things like uh, temperature differential and, and just finding interesting sensors like uh, like an infrared motion detector sensor that would like uh, light up an LED whenever my cat was walking by. Um, so simple little things like that that you know just uh, uh, I do that for de-stressing you know. It, it, I, I, I love how we're transitioning in society. We went from this, there's this horrible period in the 90s and in the early 2000s where you couldn't really do anything with your own car because you opened the hood and it was like this crazy computer and steel and plastic. Radios aren't something you can repair anymore. TVs aren't something you, and, and it was just like there was nothing you could take apart and fix. I remember when I was a little kid with my Apple IIe, when something went boink, I opened it up and shook the boards until it started working again. But now that we have the Arduino technology, now that we have 3D printers, yeah. we're re-entering that age of being able to just hack things in your garage and your basement. And, and you're yeah. getting this into schools, yeah. it sounds like. How, how are you working to get kids getting digital? Um, you know what, it, I, think, I think it's more the other way around. You know, how do you make sure that they don't rip it out of your hands faster than you can give it to them? Um, it's the, the, the intuition and the, how natural um, the young generation interacts with technologies is, is absolutely amazing. Um, I, I remember seeing that, that YouTube video of a baby pressing on a magazine and complaining to her mom that the magazine is broken because it wasn't an iPad and she didn't know how to interact with a, with a magazine, but that you know, nine-month baby knew how to interact with an iPad. Uh, so I think, I think the concept that you can control your environment and that you can uh, uh, build a little toy that you tag, that your cat plays with and that tweets you something on your account um, is something that is just natural to them, right? I mean, it's it, it's it's not that how do I get them to do something? It is it's the bigly different from the way you know you and I learn, which is sitting in the classroom listening to a professor. Maybe if you're particularly brave, you would ask a question, but that was already potentially you know crossing the line. You know, I remember a particular quantum uh, mechanics professor in that regard. Um, the way people learn today is completely different. If you sit them in a classroom, they get bored, they start Facebook, and they start Twittering or playing games. But if yeah. you put them in a room and says, build a robot, here's the stuff, and here's Google, and then you just hang in the background, and if they get stuck, you help them a little bit along, but you empower them to just do stuff, try it out, engage it, figure it out then you will have them engaged. Then you feel that they don't need um, you know, lots of support. They don't need encouragement, right? Um, there was like a great article that I read uh, which talked about how can we build more engaging education uh, because people complain that everyone hates exams and you know, they're difficult and you have to study for them and they have to repeat stuff. And then, and it was, it was a fire and said, and then I observed my son playing a video game for four hours straight where he got killed at the same point for a hundred times in a row. And he would put himself through the pain of mastering that point without any enticement whatsoever. And I think this is what when we put people in a room with problem and tools to solve it. There is an inherent curiosity that is in aid to mankind. And if we let it develop, people will put themselves through pain and difficulty and struggling to solve that problem just by themselves. And and this is this is where software engineers and and other forms of engineers all sort of get their drive is 
it's creative puzzle play at a certain level. I, yeah. I drive my husband crazy because if my software has a bug in it, I can't sleep until I've solved that bug yeah. and, and I can imagine with the Arduinos it, it's it's kind of like intellectual crack where you you can you start off with the well I'm gonna make it flash when the cat walks by and then you just keep adding new new, new features yeah. I'm going to make it swivel a laser around when the cat walks by to get the cat to chase it there's so much that you can do and and then you're just taking it to the next level by creating not our jet car future but our personal satellite future um, using Kickstarter. So yeah. so yeah. how does it feel to to hear? I know there's a lot of of conversation on the internet that people have stopped dreaming about space. And then I look at folks like you and all the people who are involved in in the International Space University and suborbital space flight and the commercial space industry. What do you say to those people that are trying to claim that Americans have stopped dreaming of space when clearly they're dreaming when they look at your project? I would just say they're plain out wrong. Um, I mean, I went to the Maker Fair here in San Francisco, and, and it's, you see 100,000 people over two days, and, and the best way to describe them is kids of all ages. Because you see 90-year-old toddlers who, who they were building a self-propelling robot out of small water bottles and the, the caps for the water bottles are the front wheels and then and you saw like them you know the two year boys they were running around with their self propelling robots on the ground they were built for literally I want to say if they were expensive five dollars a piece um, and then you have the teenagers and there was like this, this room where they where make magazine was running a soldering class and you had college girls walking around teaching grandpas and their grandchildren next side by side how to solder a circuit. So anyone who says that um, you know, there is no spirit of innovation in the U.S., um, uh, I, all I can say is you're just wrong. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's amazing what people can do when they just say, I'm going to do something. And, and we have on the comment thread, Lords is Lords Kahich, I think that's how you say it, from Mexico is saying, um, a couple of times I got so obsessed with some particular programming problems that I kept working on that problem, even in my dreams. And from time to time, I actually dreamed a solution. And, and this, is, this is the way it gets, is, is you have a problem, you want to solve it, and, and you just keep going until you find that solution. Now, what are some of the challenges that folks yeah. are already thinking of putting out for, for people to try and meet with the satellite you're going to build? Um, uh, wait, you, you mean like what kind of like experiment are people thinking yeah. about? Or? Yeah. Um, uh, there is a Discover Challenge running. Um, so people have submitted their ideas. And there is a prize to be won in the challenge. Um, it is open for three more days. I highly encourage uh, people to, to uh, participate because the first prize is you get a full week's time on the satellite and you get the full hardware, the payload, so the, all the other, you know, and all the sensors delivered to you for, to play with in any which way you want. So I don't really want to discuss the, you know, some of the best ideas that have been submitted to us because um, you know, they are in the running for a big price and, and I don't want to take that away from it. But I want to I wanna share maybe one idea that uh, is, is not making it into the satellite right now, although in the bigger one it actually might make it. And that is um, an astronomer from uh, 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 Northern California approached us and he said, um, I found this company, they do a microatomic clock. And when he said micro, I mean like literally like it's like this, you know, I don't know if you can see this, it's like, you know, an inch and a half, about half an inch or something like that. And um, we look at the power requirements. We can't fit it into a one-year satellite, but you can easily fit in a two-year satellite. And with that atomic clock, high school kids or middle school kids could prove Einstein's relativity theory on a satellite. Yeah. Now that, for me, you know, um, I, was, I was lucky enough to have a very good high, high school physics teacher who saw that how much I love physics we teach. Einstein's relativity theory and Minkowski diagram. Instead of just putting out diagrams on the blackboard, if I could say, you know, take out your laptop and let's program an experiment to prove his theory, 
that would have been so much more powerful. And today we are in a time where that actually is uh, possible. And, and for those of you who aren't aware of, of why relativity comes into play for things like this, you're dealing with, with several different relativistic effects. And, and every time you use GPS, you're actually taking advantage of relativity. So you have to worry about uh, gravitational effects that, that affect the speed of light as, as it moves away from our planet and, and light is time in a lot of ways. Um, you have to worry about the fact that the spacecraft is in motion, that, that it's in a rotating system. All of these things add up and they affect the timing that is experienced from the satellite such that the beat of time for um, the way atomic clocks work is they, they look at, at a resonant frequency. And, and so the number of, of resonances that you experience for the clock on orbit versus a matched clock on the planet Earth, those are going to differ. And um, it's, it's a lot of complex math. And what, what's kind of awesome is there's still people out there who have GPS on their phone and trust it. Who, who don't think that relativity exists, who say, oh, my stomach doesn't agree with it. And, you know, stomachs don't do relativity. They eat food. Um, so now we're going to have the ability for, for all of these people to, to test relativity for themselves using a satellite that, that they can send their own commands to and do their own timing with. So that, that's kind of a great way to silence the cranks. So, so what is that one image that you're looking forward to making yourself? You've got to have your own personal things that you're dying to do with this little satellite. Um, the image that actually for me is, is, is the most awe-inspiring one is the image where you, where you take an image from Earth and it's all ocean and you don't see a single, single land mass. And thankfully that's a pretty easy image to do because we are like 70% water and you know just 30% uh, land. Um, but I love fish in every shape or form. I, I love uh, scuba diving and I like eating fish and I like aquariums and I like fishing, you know, with my fly fishing rod. So for me, taking a picture of Earth, which is just water, um, is, is that's the image that I'm, work, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for. That, that, that sounds awesome. We, we have Thad Zabo is, is saying, um, Holy expletive, how can I incorporate that into my lectures and labs? I talk about frame dragging, et cetera, but to give students a chance to play with it, awesome. So, so how do people get involved? Where do they go? Um, the easiest thing for people to do right now is to go to www.nanosatisfy.com www.nanosatisfy um, and there they can uh, see everything about the Kickstarter campaign and they can see how they can get involved for $25 to get one picture or they can, you know, they can do uh, a little bit bigger uh, experiments for, for you know, $300 or for $500 and can choose how they want to get involved. So that I think is the, is the easiest and, and most straightforward way to really take advantage of, uh, uh, of the satellite. Um, additionally, we are always open for people coming up with ideas how to help the mission, uh, be that on the software side in developing the user interface, be that um, uh, on the hardware side in, in helping us with, uh, with testing the satellite. So, uh, and we have received uh, uh, requests from people literally from all across the world to engage with us. So that definitely is also something that, that we are open for. Um, and then I think just in general, spread the word. People know. If you know, uh, you know a high school teacher that is very inspirational and, and, and forward-looking, tell him about the project. Um, we're getting uh, people, you know, uh, a day from, uh, from New York for, for the uh, uh, Lower East Side Girls, people in, in the UK too, for high schools. Uh, my, um, but we would love to have more. Now and, I, and the last group that is artists. Um, we have a couple of arts projects. Go ahead. Um, yeah, the, the last group is is uh, is, is artists. Uh, we have a couple of, of arts projects um, that we're working on and trying to get artists to take advantage of uh, the satellite. Uh, I think artists have always uh, moved us forward as a as the people, and uh, they are pure creativity. That uh, a, a few you know uh, artists involved. 
cosmic radiation into music and, and playing it back to us. Um, and so if you know an artist who is a little bit more into interactive art or technology art, um, tell him or her about it and, and see if, if they want to do something with us. And, and your Kickstarter is still open, still looking for pledges. How much longer can people be involved via Kickstarter? Until Saturday um, 1 a.m. That, so Sunday that sounds wonderful. So Sunday 1 a.m. So, so after you finish watching Saturday Night Live, then the Kickstarter closes. That's right. That's the best way I know how to put it. Um, so <laughs> so it, sounds, <laughs> it, it sounds like this has been a wild ride and you have this great group of people put together and you're working hard to build a community around the project and and you're you're working to develop develop that every school has their own satellite every small company has their own satellite if every person had their own satellite I we, you couldn't leave the planet so so let's hope that we don't get quite that crazy um, <laughs> as as you start to think bigger and think into the future um, if you could do anything, if you could get any amount of funding you could, what is that big thing that you would build next? It, it actually, it's, it's not, not as big a thing. It literally is uh, not a satellite for every person, but access to a satellite. Um, this, this, we could, if you think of uh, when, I was, when I was at CERN, we had this access to this super high secret computer called the Cray 2, and we had like three different access codes that we had to type in um, to make it happen. And today, if I buy a new iPad, I'm carrying more computational power around with me than that Cray supercomputer. So if I find a way, and, and I believe that, that we have found that way, of allowing satellites to rapidly increase in their capacity and the capabilities the same way we can do this with computers on Earth, it is very easy for me to see that with you know, 50 satellites up there, almost anyone who wants to have a timeshare and run an experiment on a satellite actually will be able to do so. And there are not only advantages on the educational side, there is a, a, a whole piece on learning more about our planet. Um, if you talk to um, a climatologist that's trying to understand with the climate on Earth, one of the biggest cry is for more data uh, in, in, in more dimension, for more points around Earth at the same time on Earth. And that currently is simply not possible because of cost reasons. And if I can find a way to get us data um, that help climatologists uh, to, to improve their models of the Earth, that help energy companies predict better what weather is going to do to adjust their energy output for, for either air condition uh, or for heating appropriately. Um, if we can help ag uh, farmers across the world better plan their agriculture by having a better grasp on what weather patterns look like, what water supply would be look like, how the temperature is going to look like you know, over the next months for their harvest, all of those combined are, are billion-dollar industries that could benefit from better data. Um, and, and I think that is the vision that, that we are driving to, which is not only on the education side, but generally increase what we know about our own planet and just take better care of it. And, Ed, one of the things that really amazes me about the satellite is when you look back at the capabilities of the early Mariner missions, we, we launched our first missions to other planets 50 years ago this summer. And those early Mariner missions didn't have nearly the technology that this little tiny, literally about this big satellite that you're going to be launching is going to have. And so as technology has advanced, my iPhone has more technology than Mariner 2, and probably more technology than Apollo and it fits in my pocket. And, and as the sensors get smaller, as the technology gets smaller, it's going to become easier yep. to monitor our planet and understand how our planet is changing with time. And, and you're really opening the doors for people to get involved. Um, yep. What parting thoughts would you have to try and get people inspired to get engaged in, in being part of, of building our new space, space-faring future? Um, 
if anyone has like a grandma or a grandpa who is not that comfortable with the computer because they didn't grow up with it, um, just know that the way you are comfortable with a computer as compared to how you grant my computer, I want you to be as correct. I want you to think of it of being an astronaut. I want you to feel that space is something that belongs into your pocket. It's not something for governments and maybe the super rich. It is something that belongs into your pocket. Um, and if you share that dream and if you have a way to help us, be that uh, on the technology side or be that on the financing side in, in, in launching our company, be that on the educational side of spreading the word and getting schools involved, um, reach out to us. Um, our email is, can be found on nanosatisfy.com. Um, uh, Pamela has my contact information as well. We'd really like to hear from you. We really want to build something that affects everyone. Peter Diamandis tells us at Singularity Universities, find something that affects a billion people positively in 10 years. And this is what we're trying to do. And, and for people who'd like to follow you on Google+, you are Peter Wonder on Google+. And um, if you look at the Hangout post off of my Hangout, uh, off of my Google Plus feed, you'll be able to see him and circle him. And go out, get involved. And um, it, it's been such a pleasure listening to you and, and hearing such a positive, we are going into space message. It's, it's, there's a lot of depression out there. And, and it's folks like you that are saying, no, it's the individuals who are now conquering space. And, and I just have a soft spot for the entire commercial space industry and the maker attitude that all of you are bringing to it. Um, so this, this ties up this week's Science Hour. I, I can't thank you enough for being here, Peter. Um, the next Hangout is going to be tomorrow morning thank at 10 a.m. That's our weekly... Oh, no. Welcome back when, when you're ready to launch. Um, so our next Hangout is going to be tomorrow, Thursday, at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and that's going to be the weekly space Hangout hosted by Fraser Kane, where he brings the news writers to talk to you about the newsmakers. Um, we will also be doing the virtual star party on Sunday night, uh, probably starting around 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Um, sorry, starting around 8.30 or 9 o'clock Pacific, um, which unfortunately is very late on the East Coast and far too late for Europe. But those of you in Indonesia and Australia can watch breakfast while we watch the stars. Um, so get involved and come to CosmoQuest.org where you can participate in doing science using data from NASA's LRO today. And we're adding new missions and new science on a regular basis. So thank you so much again for being with us, Peter. And I look forward to having you back when your mission gets launched. Absolutely. Thank you, Pamela. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.